fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Everybody, we are back in the house of mystery. You have your host, Kevin, coming to you from XEI, WXEI, the talk of Clearview, Florida. And joining me is Rob. Say hello, Rob. Hi there, everyone. And today we have got a great show. I've been looking forward to this one because, you know, like we were saying off air, Rob, this is something new, something a little bit unique to the House of Mystery. Joining us today, we have Roseanne Lake, whose work is Left Over in China, a series that's upcoming on A&E Channel. Roseanne, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So, I mean, the question begs to be asked right up front. Roseanne, tell us a little bit about this work, a critique of China's paternalistic ideas and how things are changing. Well, Leftover in China um, is the, the title of a book that I just wrote. It uh, came out last month, and it's Leftover. Um, the, the subtitle of the book is The Women Shaping the World's Next Superpower. So that's a pretty incongruous thing, right? I'm, I'm referring to a population of women in China who are known as Leftover, and they're known as Leftover women because they've transgressed their societally imposed sell-by date of 27 uh, by not having gotten married by this age. And yes, I rather doggedly um, <laughs> argue in the book that they are the women shaping the world's next superpower for a variety of reasons, um, but mainly because China has changed so much in the past 30 years, um, and especially since 1979, when, so more than 30 years, 1979, when economic reforms began and the one-child policy started, and led to sort of the beginnings of what ended up growing up to be this population of less old women. So I don't know how demographic you want me to get, but <laughs> essentially, just to put things into context, in 1979, one-child policy starts, and of course, there's, you know, most Americans are familiar with this, mm -hmm. but what they don't realize is that, you know, the, the one-child policy was a rather gruesome cloud that actually had a very, very, very fine silver lining, right? As a result of this traditional preference for boys, you had lots of baby girls who were aborted or killed shortly after birth in China during the peak years after the one-child policy, um, which means that, you know, today China is missing a huge population of women. Um, and that there's now a surplus of men. 20 million more men than women of marriage age estimated by 2020 as a result of these imbalances. But when you look at sort of the geography of how these um, imbalances played out, China is a very big country, right? And it's a very wealthy country in more urban developed areas, and it's still a very poor country in its more, uh, more rural areas. It, it kind of straddles the world in that regard. And um, a lot of these boys, these surplus boys, were born in rural areas of the country where parents were a bit less open-minded and tradition dictated they wanted to have a boy for traditional reasons, cultural reasons, but also because, you know, when you're working on farms, this is what you prefer. Whereas in urban areas, parents were a bit more open-minded and said, you know, we've got a girl. We'll keep a girl. Um, she doesn't have a brother, so we're going to raise her as if she were our son. We're going to give her all our family resources, all our support. We're going to push her to become educated, to achieve, and to bring honor to our family. In the case of, you know, us owning a family business, we'll pass it on to her. She will inherit this family business. And China sees, um, you know, as the country is experiencing tremendous economic growth, which, of course, is, is benefited the most by people in, in urban areas where these girls are, are primarily born, um, you see China's first generations of only daughters, girls who are raised as sons. And many of these women, it turns out, to make a long story short, grew up to become left over because getting married was no longer a first priority for their mothers and for their grandmothers. 
especially, you know, their grandmothers who grew up during very heavy Confucian times when having a, a girl was considered a burden, right? And, and payday was essentially the day you could marry her off and be compensated with a dowry for the pains of having raised her, right? Um, oh, wow. I even talked about <laughs> the pains of having raised a daughter. It was like pouring water out of a jug, you know, and the, there were parents who would, would really look forward to the day where they could marry off their daughter because it, was, it really was payback day. I, I cite a case of a man um, in southern China who was looking for a sizable dowry to, to compensate for the pain of having raised a daughter, but he also wanted to be compensated in the afterlife. So as part of the deal, he wanted it like an, a deluxe coffin so he could be comfortable um, forever. So no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, this, this, is this, this is what this man believes. Man, <laughs> he had to I, suffer during his life with a daughter, and he wanted to, uh, you know, uh, be comfy uh, afterwards. I, I'm raising my third. I'm just picturing what's coming for me. Oh gosh! <laughs> well, fortunately, we don't live in Confucian America. <laughs> Um, I, I'd like to ask a question of you. Um, I, I mean, this is fascinating, and I really want to get into it, especially about this A4 waste thing I was reading about, and uh, a show about that was, of course, was a documentary on British uh, television, BBC, about how the men are having it so bad. But um, I, how did you get into this? Just, I'm just curious. How did this start for you? It was all a big old accident. Um, I studied Romance languages in college, and I thought, you know, these came pretty easily to me. I wanted a real linguistic challenge, and Chinese seemed like a good idea. It was. It is quite a challenge linguistically. Um, so I went to China in 2009, right after the Olympics, when Beijing had just had a giant coming out party to the world, right? It was making headlines. Um, the Olympics really sort of just thrust it out into the world stage, and there was an appetite for news there. And as someone who was interested in learning Mandarin, but also... Um, fresh out of graduate school, the idea of sticking around in New York and, you know, getting coffee in a magazine didn't really sound that exciting. And so I went to China um, to pick up the language and where I thought, you know, I'm a little bit more exotic here. I can pitch to the editors and actually, you know, maybe file clips and do real stories. And as soon as I got there, I bought um, an electric scooter because traffic in Beijing is just snarling. And, um, yes. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, it's not the other way to get around. So I bought an electric scooter and it was hot orange and I named it Fonda, just like the offering. And Fonda and I became best friends. I would zip around town on this electric Vespa, and um, it was just fascinating to be in this, you know, this modern metropolis that where so much was happening. I mean, I'd be in a bike lane, and to my right, there'd be like a tricycle piled high with, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of, of cabbages, you know, that a peasant would be bringing into the city to sell. And then to my left, there would be, you know, a, a 60, 70 story building going up at a dizzying pace. And it would just be fascinating to be in the middle of it. Although at the time I didn't speak Mandarin and didn't understand what was going on. There was just, I was very curious and there was so much going around, going on around me. And so when I decided to stay a bit longer, because I couldn't leave Fonda behind, it was just way too much fun to be around that on that thing, I got a job at a television station, and I was surrounded by these so-called leftover women. And I didn't realize they were left over until after our first Chinese New Year. So my first Chinese New Year in China, everyone goes home, goes to see their families. I went to Yunnan and biked around on, on motorbikes with a few friends around Kunming, and we had a great time, got back to the office. And noticed that my other otherwise very chipper colleagues were in very different spirits. And it kind of struck me that, you know, most of the women I was working with were in charge. They were the editors, they were the producers, um, they were bilingual, they were running the show. And it was an international news network. We were broadcasting news about China and the U.S. And, um, you know, I, I worked with men, of course, I had male colleagues, but a lot of them were the camera guys. And they were bilingual, and they were kind of just following orders, right? And that was not the impression that I had of China. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't do Asian studies. I, I didn't know much about China when I got there, so I was kind of struck by that. But um, when the mood was very different after Chinese New Year, I asked around because I thought there were actually problems at the company. And one of the superiors said, oh, no, they're just quiet. They're just upset because they're not married. And this oh, didn't make any whoa. sense. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, what, is the Communist Party giving away free honeymoons or something that they're missing out on because they're not engaged? What's going on? Let's make a deal or a dating game. <laughs> exactly. It was like, what? how does this have anything to do with it? And most of them were 23, 24. The oldest was 27. And, you know, of course, this didn't make any sense. So I started speaking with them, and indeed, they explained that they had just come back from their hometown with a fresh lacquering of marriage pressure. 
um, you know, they had graduated, they were working, and it didn't matter that they were bilingual, that they were the first women to, in their families to go to college, that they were working in a major city, and that they were supporting themselves. All of this was eclipsed by the very simple fact that they hadn't gone home with a boyfriend or news of a potential husband, which meant that news of a potential grandchild <laughs> wasn't anywhere in the imminent future, and this for parents was a great cause for distress. Because ultimately, despite the tremendous economic growth of China and, and how much greater access people have gotten to education, I mean, not just women, men too, um, in the 90s, China tripled the amount of, of the GDP uh, that it, it spent on education and, and, you know, thousands more um, schools, universities popped up and, and there really was a very concerted push to education. But traditional values like this idea that, you know, a woman's value is largely defined by her biology and her fertility and this idea that, you know, after 27, your children have come out funky, so you need to have, um, you need to have them beforehand. That tradition still weighs quite heavily. And so, you know, these women, I learned, were being treated like burning buildings. You know, their relatives, parents, the grandparents, aunts, uncles, relatives, meddling taxi drivers were all offering to set them up on blind dates. Um, because it was just considered an imperative that they get read. And here they were back in the city, um, you know, away from, you know, physically <laughs> distant from, from this source of pressure, but kind of still licking their wounds. And it struck me that, you know, for them, they kind of described marriage, as I write in the book, as um, an ingrown toenail. You know, something that this niggling pain that if you kind of leave it alone, it's just going to get worse. It was something they needed to address. Um, <laughs> because yeah, everyone was very bothered about it. At, at this point, Rosando, I, I've got to ask. I mean, other than maybe being married and having children or, or, you know, I understand, you know, where you're coming from culturally. But these are educated women. Can the Chinese culture or the Confucian culture not see them as valuable resources of education, academics, you know, um, they're productive members of society, even in industrial, you know, genres. I mean, they're, wow, you know, I, it's it starting time. to hit me now, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, one of the things um, I'm curious about is, you said as low as 23 and 24, so they're actually considered leftovers at that early in age? Yeah, they're leftovers in training, and it's quite wild, I mean, or expected to be. I, ever <laughs> since moving training. back to the U.S., I, like that. <laughs> <laughs> I now um, split my time between New York and Havana, because I, I cover Cuba for The Economist, but I've been spending a lot more time in New York, and I'm meeting a lot of young Chinese women who are studying at NYU, Columbia, and a lot of them are studying journalism or documentary filmmaking, so when I go back to an alumni event at NYU or whatnot, I meet them, and they say, oh, you know, you lived in China, what did you do there? And I said, well, well, I wrote a book about leftover women. They said, oh, I'm a leftover woman, and they're 19. And I go, what? Well, how can you possibly be a leftover yes. woman? They go, I just know I'm going to be. I have all the characteristics of a future leftover woman. I mean, marriage is something that is in my list of priorities for my young adult years. Is not my sole priority. And given the fact that I'm studying abroad, I'm bilingual, I want to travel, I want to work in different places, you know, I'm probably not going to get married as early as my family would want me to be, and so I'm, I'm likely going to be left over. And it's, it's a left-handed compliment. I mean, the word is very unsavory when you hear it in English, you know, just, you are a leftover woman. But in China, there are enough of these women at this point, and, you know, there's, there's a, of course, there's a negative understanding of this. I mean, the word, is, the term in Chinese is sheng yu. And sheng is the same, it's just, so leftover woman is an exact translation. Sheng is the same prefer, uh, prefix as you would say when you say sheng tai or leftover food. So really, I mean, the implication is that these oh, women are the stuff of doggy bags and garbage disposal. But when you meet them, it's all the contrary. And that's why I kind of couldn't shut up about them and had to write a book about them because China is a land of contradictions. And this is one of those ultimate contradictions. You know, as you said, an important part of the economy, um, you know, all the way, all, all along, like during the Cultural Revolution, during China becoming um, the world's manufacturing capital, um, you know, if, as you can read in Factory Girl, the great book by Leslie Chang, you know, Chinese women were part of that workforce. They were putting together those iPads and assembling those Nike sneakers. And now China is a different type of economy. It's trying well, to shake I, off I, that I, um, manufacturing I have a question class. for you about that. In the show about the men, it focused on those kind of factories, and the women were just kind of working there until they could get married. And the young men would 
they were interviewing them and they were saying how they would ask someone out and they, didn't, and they had little hope. And this one young man did ask one out and she just turned him down because there's so many more men than women, just as you say. And they also focused on a young man in a uh, village and his parents were quite upset with him because he was almost 35 and could not find a wife. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. I mean, if the pressure on the men is so great to get married and they want to get married, why aren't they more accepting of the leftover women? Well, so this is the thing. Um, when I was talking a little bit earlier about the geographical breakdown of this, you have a lot of these surplus men concentrated in areas where parents were more keen to have a son and so fewer girls were born, right? So you have, in, in, in nature, the, the sex ratio at birth, the average sex ratio at birth is usually about 100 girls for 105 to 106 boys. There tend to be more boys born in nature. Slightly. But, you know, leading, slightly more, yeah. But leading up to the one-child policy, because, of course, there's always been a traditional preference for boys um, and in times of you know scarcity parents would be more likely to to have you know to create conditions to keep the boy alive rather than a girl um, you know during one child policy this is exacerbated so we see that you know in cities the imbalance doesn't really extend beyond 115 117 18 boys to girls um, but in rural areas it goes to 120 130 140, wow. 150, 160, 170. There are rural areas of China where you've had, you know, in a given year, you'd have 100, for every 100 girls that are born, 170 boys are born, right? So these are very, very imbalanced areas. And so there, there are, there just mathematically, there aren't enough women for, you know, to go around. And the types of women that I profile in my book are, you know, these, these fleshful women. So many of them were born in more urban areas. And they're quite well educated and quite financially independent. And so it's not so much about the men not accepting them or, or them not accepting the men who are maybe not, you know, as high flying. I think the fundamental problem, there's an element of that, right? Because China is a society that has clung to this idea of marriage hypergamy. So man must marry down, woman must marry up to someone taller, wealthier, more educated, and blah, blah, blah. That's not going to work out anymore because tides have changed. You now have more women getting college degrees than men, but also because your supply and demand doesn't work out, right? Most of your men, your surplus men, are located in these rural areas, and you have, you know, these populations of women who are left over in more urban areas. So geographically, they're not going to cross paths. In addition to, you know, from, from a from a cultural perspective or an economic perspective or an educational perspective, they're also not ideally compatible as far as that marriage hypergamy system goes. So you do have two populations of leftovers, the leftover men in the urban areas, or sorry, in the rural areas who haven't been left out of China's economic growth and don't have much education and don't have many professional opportunities, and women in urban areas who have the contrary. They have all of that going for them, but there aren't as many men for them to choose from um, because, you know, marrying up is hard when you're pretty high up there yourself. It's just growing pains. You know, other cultures have been through it. Well, let me, well, let oh, me sorry, get rid of a, of a misconception here. You know, since, since we're talking, and I'm, I'm beginning to picture this in my head, you know, you want boys in a more, let's call it the farming communities. Whereas mm -hmm. in the urban centers, you know, women have a, a, a great role. Now, the misconception was with the one child policy that if a young or if a girl was born, that they would actually go so far as to exterminate that life and wait yeah. for a boy. Is that true? Mm hmm. That certainly was. I mean, it certainly was in, in areas where tradition weighed more heavily. It was very common, and it oh was common God. before the one-child policy. I mean, I spoke to a young girl who is about 21. She's studying um, in the States. She's Chinese, and she identifies as a leftover woman already because she, you know, expects to be headed down that path. And she told me a story about her grandmother, and she said, you know, my grandmother... Um, is the fourth oldest daughter in her family, but they call her the oldest sister because her first three sisters um, were killed upon birth. All three oh of them were thrown into a river. Oh no. And her grandmother was actually destined for the same fate, but as her parents were walking her over to the river, she opened her eyes. And they were spooked by this, and so they decided to keep her. But they didn't raise her themselves. They gave her away to another family, and she didn't get any access to education. And, and you know, as soon as she could, she was, she was married, and she had many children. 
one of which was um, this girl's father. And so she was kind of contrasting her mom's life and the very, very, very little worth that, or sorry, her grandmother's life and the very, very little worth that um, women had, you know, when her grandmother was born with her own because she was born into a family where, you know, her parents um, decided to keep her only daughter. They kept her. And part of her story, part of why she was telling me this was that she was explaining her dad kind of always begrudgingly um, had her. Um, he, he, he always expressed his preference for a son. And in fact, you know, the fact that his, his wife never had a son for him actually was part of the reason that her parents ultimately divorced and her dad um, married a much younger woman and, and now has this beloved son. Um, so, you know, this, this value or this, this, yeah, this, you know, placing greater value on one gender over another is something that has persisted in China for a very long time. I certainly think it's changing. And part of, you know, her story and what she was telling me was that, um, you know, because of the one child policy and because she was an only daughter initially, um, you know, women, the status of women had, in China has, has gone up um, because they've gotten, you know, the lion's share of family resources that they may not have gotten had they had brothers. Um, but, of course, you know, as far as complete equality, it's, it's not there yet. But, but things have certainly improved, especially when you consider, you know, what her grandmother's life was worth when she was a baby girl. Well, um, I was reading this article about uh, the young woman in, in China, especially in the cities, and there's this fad for an A4 waist where they want to be really, really thin and they want a sheet of A4 sized paper to cover their entire waist and they'll take photos of it. I'm kind of caught in the middle here. I, I don't understand. If men saw it, number woman, and even in factories in Beijing, the men have to uh, practically beg to go on a date with them because they want more than this country bumpkin who came to the city looking for a woman have to offer. Um, why is there such stress on them? the women to, to conform to such incredible standards. Uh, I just don't get that. That's a great question, and my, I've not heard of this, and it's certainly not something that I picked up when I was in China. <laughs> I never had any aspirations in an A4 piece of paper um, around my waist, but uh, that, that's quite the accomplishment. I mean, China's big place is home to 650 million women, and really they all have different, <laughs> different views on how easier. large their waist should be <laughs> and how and how white their skin should be and, and everything else. I mean, you know, well, they, they a 100 won wrist where they can actually wrap a 100 won note around their wrist completely. So, I mean, this, this seems extreme, doesn't it? <laughs> it does seem extreme. And what I'm going to guess and, and this is just your guessing. I've, I have yet to interview a woman who's, who's attempted to do this and who can wrap a 100 MMD note around her wrist. But I, my guess is, so marriage in China for a very long time has been a rather mercenary and transactional affair. So based on what we said earlier, with regards to Confucianism, right, you pawn off your daughter in exchange, you know, to the highest bidder in exchange for you know, the highest dowry, whatever you can get out of this. Um, during the Cultural Revolution, if you're showing up at a, at a work unit, at a factory, or wherever it is you're sent to work, um, or later, after the Cultural Revolution, right, and if you're not married, um, there's no housing for unmarried people. So the head of your work unit is going to find you a spouse and partner you off, and, and then you get back to work. Um, and so, it, you know, romantic love hasn't for a very long time been a primary reason for marriage in China because it, it hasn't really been allowed, right? According to Mao, romantic love was a bourgeois sentiment, and he had a nation to build, so he needed people not falling in love and being distracted, but focusing on other things. And those mercenary remnants of, of how marriages are contracted kind of still remain. And I bring this up because I suspect, I mean, as a result of China's tremendous economic growth, um, marriage has become, for some women, and because of this, you know, persistence of a woman marrying up and a man marrying down, it's become an express elevator to a better life. So, you know, if you are a young woman who maybe hasn't studied too much and maybe doesn't have too many means of her own, but is looking to marry a very wealthy guy, um, these, you know, these can be part of the criteria that men are looking for. It's, it's not all men, certainly not, but, you know, very small waists and very white skin and smaller faces are highly prized in China. And so if you want to be a mistress, mistress culture is very vibrant in China. Uh, one of the main characters in my book is a mistress. Extramarital activity is, is accepted, and it's kind of expected of a man once he's reached a certain level of wealth and, and status. 
um, this is a way to sort of guarantee that, right? You can use this very small waste of yours and this very small wrist of, wrist of yours as an asset to, you know, become the wife or the mistress of a very wealthy man who values this type of thing. And you can, you know, instantly be sort of ricocheted into a much more comfortable life if you manage to pull that off. So I would suspect that part of that is related to that desire, although I haven't done any in-depth investigation. Well, also, I was wondering, you were talking about uh, it being the male-dominated culture and stuff, and um, would not modern internet, uh, whatever they use for Google or whatever over there, and, um, I do. Their, and their Facebook, media. right, social media, would that not uh, exacerbate it? I mean, if all you're hearing online is that uh, you need to get married, you need to get married. And this, this is what you right have to now. look like to do it. Right, and, and but also, <laughs> just think about the idea of leftover women in general, I mean, might it not making it uh, be making it a worse situation? Is what I'm wondering. Well, as far as social media con is concerned, I don't think a lot of the pressure comes from social media. It's the the vast majority of this pressure is is social, but it comes from parents. They are certainly the greatest perpetrators of this. I mean, it's it's the traditional aside of society. It's, you know, parents who are worried that after you reach a certain age, no man is going to want to marry you. And as a result, you know, you won't have grandchildren. And you have to remember, China is a heavily collectivist society. That's changing, right? And we're seeing more of a rise of an individual as people have access to more capital and, and are able to travel more to other places. But, you know, what your neighbors and what your relatives think of you and of your family is still a great matter of nianza or this concept that, you know, loosely trans Translates of space. You you have to sort of if you're not obeying with the socially prescribed norms and timelines, um, you know people are going to stop talk. Tongues are going to start wagging. Mm -hmm. And so it's not. I mean, social media may be a place where people air their grievances about being um, pressured to marry, and you certainly see it come up in you know um, uh, in songs or in television shows. There was a wonderful television show that was later censored, but it was called San Yehunba, Let's Get Married. And it was about a rather histrionic mother who kept on pressuring her 32-year-old, you know, accomplished daughter into finding a mate in all sorts of really dramatic ways. Um, and, you know, think, there's also really popular dating shows. Fei uh, Chang Wu Rao, I think, had his peak had something like 500 million viewers. Take wow. that Super Bowl. I mean, <laughs> it's just not going to happen, you know. Yeah. Um, and this is a really popular dating show. And there was another one that came out, uh, I guess, earlier in the fall um, or became very popular in the fall. And it was actually a dating show in which you'd have um, uh, parents be on the dating show with you. So the parents would be able to meet prospective partners and they would be able to chime in and, you know, sort of give their view on whether or not they considered that the person, you know, on the show would be a good match. Um, one, of the, one of the ones they like headlined. Sorry? That's always the best. <laughs> exactly, but with parents. <laughs> uh, Suzanne, I had one more question for you. Is part of the problem, perhaps, I don't know if, if, if it's true in China like it is here, but uh, it's the male name wanting to carry on, the, the family name. Is that part of the problem, too, you think? That the, the well, pressure is on for the man to get a younger woman so that uh, they can have children and carry on the family name? Or, or do they not do that in China? Does it matter? No, they do. They do. I mean, the, it would be it would be the male the male who you know who who passes along the name, and that's certainly an issue. I mean, I think it's important for men and women in China to reproduce, right? Especially in this era of only children, because parents, even of daughters, want their family to continue. They want to have a grandchild because they don't. You know, this is sort of what they're supposed to do in their retired years. This is all of their friends are going to have a grandchild or grandchildren at this point. And it's just it's hard to socialize if you don't have that. This is the first thing that people are going to ask. You know, how is your child? Is he or she married? When's the grandchild coming? This is just the way it works in China. And so, you know, the pressure is great for men um, because, you know, they're going to pass along the family name. But for both genders, it's considered very unfilial. Um, very, you know, a very egregious sin to not produce an heir, to not produce a grandchild for your grandparents because this is, or for your parents because this is just what's expected of you. And actually, it's quite interesting now that China has a two-child policy. Um, I've spoken to some women who are only daughters from, you know, well-to-do families in big cities like Beijing and Shanghai who say, it's no longer acceptable for me to only have one child. My parents tell me I must have two. And this is because um, they suspect that one child 
um, you know, my, my soul, my, if I have one child, that child will sort of belong to my husband's parents because they are the parents of the male and they're sort of the more important grandparents. So they get sort of a larger stake of, of my child's life. Um, yes, and yeah. so my parents want me to have a second child that can inherit it, inherit my family name because they think they've poured so many resources into raising me that it's only fair that this be equal and that they have their own designated grandchild with their own last name to spoil and coddle and swaddle and all of those good things and brag about to friends and take to parks and bounce on their knees um, because this is how it's done. So we're seeing that. I mean, it's it's still this, these Confucian ideas of like, we've poured resources into you and, and we want to be compensated for our efforts and for our investment that's still very much playing out with very little regard to what women themselves want right this woman's like ah oh, you know I'm, I'm i'm working i'm warming myself up to the idea of a first one i'm not quite sure all i do and then you know another woman i spoke with lives in the united states and she just had her first she's married and, and she had her first baby boy and her father said you need to have three children because anyone in China can have two. You live in the U.S. now. You're better than that. You need to have more. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a competition kind of like, now. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, it's a competition. <laughs> well, yeah, but so two, children, are very uh, the two children is still not replacement level. I mean, you, you have normal attrition of childhood diseases, accidents, that sort of thing. So uh, is China, you think, planning to extend it to maybe three children uh, so that it's a, just a closer to replacement level or a little bit more? Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, I've spoken to demographers who follow this very closely and who are sort of advising the Chinese government on future population growth, which, of course, is a matter of concern because it is below replacement. It has been for a really long time. The two-child policy is not going to help that. Um, and they predicted that um, quite soon we'll probably see the entire that, that policy abolished. Um, it hasn't happened. I mean, China just had uh, the Yang Wei, the big, you know, Communist Party meeting that happened in the month of March. Um, it was, you know, there were rumors that it might be abolished during this meeting. That didn't happen. But surely numbers are not what they were predicted to be. Um, so the numbers that the Chinese government predicted of new births following the two-child policy are, are fall quite short of, of the actual numbers of births and what, uh, or the number of births. And what we actually have seen is... Um, Instead of younger women having a second child or more children, um, a lot of the births have been to older moms, which has led to complications in, in, um, in you know, uh, infant mortality rates and whatnot. I, I spoke to a few people from private hospitals, and they said, yeah, I mean, we had, you know, many women in their 40s were coming to us to have babies, and we've had more complications than ever. Um, so none of this was predicted when the two-child policy came along, and I think they need to think very seriously about what they're going to do to, you know, incentivize for their population growth because I think it's also become very clear to them that fertility is not a switch. In some ways, you know, it was easy to enforce a one-child policy in the days when the policy came out because people were still working in work units. So you could very easily threaten them with losing their jobs in addition to the fines um, if they weren't respecting the policy. Now, you know, that threat can still apply to people who have work units or who work for the state, but people in the private sector are a little bit easier, a little bit more difficult to control, right? So this is something that, you know, is going to be a matter of concern, which is why I argue that, you know, women are at the center of so much of this. And I decided they were worth writing a book about because, you know, who other than, than your women are going to be having these children for you going forward? Um, it would probably be wise to not call them names and to just, you know, create, more forgiving timelines for their young adult years and, and not make it, you know, 27 be the, the last stop before spinsterhood, right? You can you can have healthy babies after that, and, and you can also balance a rewarding career, which is probably an important part of China's economic story going forward because, you know, women have played an important part of that growth so far. Um, so it's certainly a challenge they'll have, and it's not going to be an easy one, um, but these are growing pains, and ultimately, you know, a sign of, of China having given its women opportunities that, um, you know, few women, in, in, if you, I, I compare in the book with um, other East Asian tiger economies like Japan, South Korea, Singapore, you know, these are economies that took off. Um, just as rapidly as China did. 
And in some ways, you can consider them, you know, future models of what China's economy might look like. And also from a demographic perspective, right? These are the countries where you have some of the lowest birth rates in the world. And it's an alarming concern, right? Singapore, with its 6 million people, is facing a serious demographic crisis. And they're not very open to immigration. So what to do um, and, you know, the implications on the economy are, are big questions that they're asking themselves. Japan, I mean, Christine Lagarde has been saying for years that the Japanese economy is not what it could be um, because women are not, you know, a vital part of the workforce. It's, it's not uncommon for a Chinese, uh, Japanese woman to have a child or maybe two children and, and check out of the workforce for 13 years. That doesn't happen in China. Women are involved. Um, I guess the, the upshot to the very zealous parents who are keen to have a grandchild means that as soon as you have one, you can hand it off to your parents, and they will very gladly provide free child care. Oh, much, um, much so, like you know, we do here. <laughs> uh, not quite. I guess it depends who you ask, right? <laughs> but, well, um, that, um, let me ask this. Um, a a two-part question. Has social media, because you, you guys mentioned this earlier, you and Rob, has social media, or not even necessarily social media, just the media in general, has it had an impact in changing the way that Chinese culture sees the, and I'm quoting, leftovers, and your your book gives us hope that there's a bright future ahead for these leftovers because China is now seeing their contribution. What's in the future for these women? All right. Well, for the social media question, you know, as, as big of a topic as this seems to be, what struck me initially and sort of what motivated me to write about it was that it didn't seem to be something that women were discussing all that much. So when I first started doing this in 2010, it was like, it felt like being left over was a burden that you dealt with individually. And it was kind of something that you, you know, discussed with your family and, and you tried to sort of keep the pressure at bay. But there weren't sort of any support groups or movements or women just weren't even discussing this with themselves. Like, yeah, I'm the left over and I feel this pressure and it's not great. And I discovered, you know, that they were quite open to speaking about it because they would speak to me about it, but just from a cultural perspective, it was kind of considered dirty laundry or personal problems that you just don't discuss very openly with friends. And this is, you know, a cultural thing. And that has changed. I mean, there's been there's been more awareness and you see it on social media and, and it's it's out there and I think people are becoming increasingly willing to sort of share their views on the topic and join, you know, chat groups. WeChat is a very powerful um, communication and chat platform in, in China. And you don't necessarily have groups of like, you know, in defense of leftovers or things like that. <laughs> um, but you have groups of, you know, women who will talk about different things from, you know, um, advice in college or advice in the workforce and, you know, the dating pressures that they face. So there's definitely a bit more solidarity than um, I initially sensed in 2010. And, and that's certainly a result of social media. And the fact that it's just so easy to create a group and add friends, do a live event, and then, you know, follow up with people, share new and that sort of thing. So that's an important part of it, for sure. Um, it was it was wise of you to pick up on that because it's an important part of the story. As for these women going forward, I mean, I I would argue that they are important an important part of China's economic and demographic future. Absolutely. You know, one because they're very well poised to contribute positively to to the economy, and from a demographic perspective, you know, until <laughs> technology can replace women as as um, you know as the incubators of babies, they're also a very important part. Um, you know, as mothers and uh, of uh, you know of mothers of a future population. So, you know, overall is a very positive thing, and especially, you know, when you look at um, how Japan, South Korea, and Singapore didn't really manage to keep women involved in the formal economy like China does, I'm more optimistic on China's future growth um, as a result of just how involved they are now. I, I see it very unlikely. You can call them whatever you want, but, you know, they're out in the workforce. They're educated and they're ambitious. You know, they have foreign degrees. They're, they speak multiple languages. There's, I, I don't really think there's any way there's any word, any possible, you know, there's any way to get them back to not being, you know, part of the outside sphere and productive members of the economy. So it's going to take some time 
I mean, um, you know, when, when economies grow so quickly and opportunities change so rapidly, genders need to adjust, right? It, you know, women need to understand that, you know, their lives are going to be very different from the lives of their moms and their grandmothers. And, you know, men also kind of need to take a beat and say, wait a minute, you know, the, the woman I marry is probably going to want very different things and behave very differently than my mom did towards my dad. It's just, you know, it's, 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 you have to. It takes time to adjust, and mm-hmm. there's actually a great Spanish demographer who's done work on how this change plays out in over 60 countries in the world. So how you know when women start getting higher or greater degrees, college degrees than men, how that changes mating and dating, and you know he sort of summed up the situation not just in China but in the world because we're seeing you know women getting later, getting married later, and having children later or not at all, um, not just in China but in all parts of the world. He summed it up quite nicely, I think, when he said that men are looking for women who have yet, uh, who no longer exist, and women are looking for men who have yet to exist. <laughs> I just thought that was a sort of very, <laughs> oh, very that's playful that's way. Slippery. That's for um, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Now, what about <laughs> your series? Uh, how is your uh, AD series going to be? Um, I'm curious to see. It's, it's a number of episodes, correct? Do I have an AE series? This is news to me. Uh, really? Because um, I thought that you were supposed to have one. An AE? Was it AE? Yes. You have? Yeah. No, you don't have one. You should have one. I you don't have one. one. No. Well, I'd love that. to have one, but as far as I know, I don't have one. Well, <laughs> well doggone it! It's in the email. It's. In... We... Yeah. I guess we can edit that out. <laughs> I'll have to get to the bottom of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know how to get around that. <laughs> well, um, if you were to have the series, just out of curiosity, how would you divide it up? I mean, say it's uh, like a six-part series. Uh, I'm just curious. Would you focus on the men's side of it and the women's side of it? Would you be balanced, or is, would it be mostly focused on the plight of the women? Or No, I'd have to focus on both, absolutely. I mean, it's you know, in many ways, the men have it worse. You know, the women will be fine, right? They're they're educated. They live in urban areas. They have money. They can support themselves. The only, they, you know, ultimately their issue is is just that they they the supply of the types of men that they are looking to marry is in short supply, and so they're facing this issue. But otherwise, you know, life is good. I would say for for the men in China. I mean, you know, we could say starting with these these men in rural areas, there aren't women to go around. And so, you know, they still face a tremendous amount of pressure to get married and, and to produce an heir, but there aren't women to do that with. And so that often means that they use whatever money they have combined with their parents' life savings to buy a bride from a place like Thailand or Vietnam. Um, it, this is dope, an industry for bride napping as well, because there's a demand for Chinese men who are... And who aren't in a geographical radius of too many women to begin with, accumulating this sort of wealth is, is difficult. Oh, I, I was going to ask about, about that. Uh, I was going to ask about that because mm-hmm. now some of the show I watched was about men and the fact, well, it's the women too. And the men said that the women are striving really hard to be attractive and they're achieving it, but that they're extremely picky. And they blame the yeah. woman for being too picky. So is that, that what you're basically saying here is that the women want more than they can offer? Well, I mean, that could be, right? As I said earlier, like, marriage is this kind of express elevator to a man that they can find because that ultimately means that, you know, they're going to have a much better life. And then there are other women um, who are less concerned with material possessions because, you know, they have enough of that stuff on their own or that's just not what they're interested in. And they will think more about, you know, well, how is this guy going to be as a life partner? You know, is he going to help me out at home? Um, or am I going to have to take care of everything on my own? Is he going to support me in, you know, my ambitions or my career? Um, their priorities for what they're looking for are made are different. And you have all kinds in China. You still have, you know, the women who will very much rely on, on, on looks to snag as wealthy a guy as they can, and other women who, you know, it's, they're not concerned with the material as, as much as, you know, um, perhaps the man's personality or just his way of thinking. You get, you get both of that. 
uh, you get both those things still. Well, sure. well, how about the uh, leftover woman? Are they beginning to look abroad for a better class of man? Or, you know, one with a higher education and uh, that sort of thing? I mean, if they're, if, rather than be left over, because the men don't measure up, and apparently if you're, you know, a cloud harper on a farm somewhere, they, to them they don't, uh, then do they not look abroad too, just as some men are? Certainly. I mean, foreign men um, in China are very popular, and Chinese women abroad are very popular. Um, you know, there are plenty of, of, of marriages and partnerships that, that um, come out of this situation. The only thing that complicates it slightly is, um, you know, a lot of these women, as I said earlier, are only daughters, and their parents don't want them to be that far away. Um, so, you know, whereas they may find that a foreign man conforms more with sort of what they're looking for in a partner, uh, geographic distances sometimes make that complicated. It's, it's something they have to keep into it, take into account uh, because, you know, there's pressure from parents to, hey, wait a minute, you know, you're kind of our retirement plan. Who's going to take care of us? There aren't that many retirement homes or pension funds or much of a social security net, right? Your kid in China is um, is all of that to you, which is why parents, I think, have not, um, have not sort of let up in terms of, you know, how much sway they feel like they can have over who their kids marry. Because ultimately, it's the nest egg, right? If your child marries well, you can sort of rest assured that you will have a more comfortable retirement. Whereas if your, you know, child can marry someone from a much lower socioeconomic class, that may mean that your golden years might not be as comfortable. So, um, you know, Chinese parents consider this quite heavily. But there certainly are, you know, women marrying foreigners. Um, you're seeing it more and more, especially as more and more of them study outside of China. Is there class distinction? I mean, is part of the social stigma that you're marrying beneath yourself? Mm, probably. It's, it's not to the extent that it would be in India, right, where that's pretty much just not permissible. Um, is- in China, it's more this idea of or matching doors and matching windows. It's considered that an ideal match um, is from a family with, you know, similar doors and similar windows to you. You kind of want to stay in the same class or, you know, go above, um, but you don't want to go much below because it's considered a not so, um, you know, not so safe thing to do. Well, that's intriguing. Um, I, I just, you know, I think you should do an AD series because, the show I watched did talk about the woman, but never mentioned the leftover woman. What it really showed was that women seemed to have the big and choice through the whole thing. And I came away thinking, wow, women have it really great in China. Never even, they never even mentioned leftover woman. This was like just a few weeks ago. So I think you need to do a AD show. We need some balance here. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. Make some calls. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so, so what's coming next for Roseanne? What's coming next? Uh, well, I cover Cuba now, which is a fascinating oh, little beat and so different from China. Um, China's big. There's tons of money. Things move quickly. It's a super connected society despite censorship. Everyone is very much online. You can be nine months old. You can be 99. Everyone's online. Um, Whereas Cuba is tiny, small, not lots of money. Things happen really slowly. And not much much of internet. <laughs> not much internet at all. Um, but it's just been fascinating to be somewhere so different, and yet where, from an ideological perspective, there certainly are similarities. Um, Cuba and China enjoy very good diplomatic relations, much better than the ones enjoyed by the U.S. and Cuba, that's for sure. Um, and you're seeing more and more Chinese investment in Cuba. So for me, it's been a treat to get out of the pollution of Beijing and into the sun and the reggaeton music <laughs> of Cuba um, and to either zip around in like a, you know, a 1950s American jalopy, a glorious, you know, hot pink or canary yellow car um, or uh, a brand new Chinese taxi. Um, because a lot of the Geely uh, Chinese brand of cars are, are showing up in, in Cuba. Um, and just to sort of see, you know, a lot of the investments that, that could have gone to U.S. companies and a lot of the things that we could have done there not happening, but these opportunities being scooped up by the Chinese who sort of waited to see who the new president would be and how that plan would work um, and are now, you know, making pretty serious inroads as far as tourism goes, renewable energy, all sorts of projects. Um, so it's, it's a great new beat. 
And it allows me to sort of stay connected to China because China is an important part of a Cuba's economic future. It's one of the few countries that can afford to sell at things at this point because Cuba takes a while to pay back. Um, and But also just sort of a change of pace in a country that is kind of maybe where China was in 1979, right? Before all those economic reforms and all that economic growth. It's pretty clear that, you know, China's reforms won't be as dramatic. Uh, Cuba's reforms won't be as dramatic and the economic growth won't be as extreme. Um, but it is kind of a funny way to travel back in time and, and experience a very, very unique culture. Um, that's very different from just about any place in the world. Sounds fascinating. Maybe that's an A&E series, too. There I'm not go. sure. <laughs> Well, where can people find out more about you? I'm, I'm, I'd be curious myself to check in on you. I mean, you're going to write a book about Cuba, and I hope you do, because uh, that's a culture in transition, and you seeming to get a snapshot of it right now. So where can people get, uh, get more information about you? Well, my website has all the mischief that I've been up to, so that's just www.rosannlake.com. It's R-O-S-E-A-N-N, lake, like a body of water, dot com. And I, I've been on the road <laughs> since the book came out. I'll be in Seattle um, later this week. I'll be at Third Place Books on Friday night. Um, and then I'm off to China. So I'll be, um, I'll be around. But, yes, pretty much the best way to keep tabs on me is through the website and, you know, links to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all that silly stuff. Um, and and your book, where can they go for that? The book's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, pretty much anywhere uh, good books are sold. Fortunately, you sound like an advertisement. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I wish I could do that when I'm on shows. <laughs> I'm gonna clip that and use it. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> well, Roseanne, thank you so much. Thank you for being on the show with us today and filling us in on the latest. Um, after you get finished with your work on Cuba, would you like to join us again? That would be very fun. There's a big transition happening in April, so it's worth keeping tabs on. Awesome. Well, again, we've been joined today by Roseanne, and her work is The Leftover Women in China. And again, it's been absolutely educational for me. Thank I you. Thank you for being on with us today. Thank you both. It's been a whole lot of fun. It has. Thank you. To find out more about our show, guests or listen to a previous show visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com the mission has been completed the end by george he's got it it is the end i'll see you if you're lying to me i'll be back this has been a production of something weird media 